Yeah, here we are back at the grassy knoll, and um, we're going to do another reading from uh, Common Sense Renewed by Robert Christian uh, about the Georgia Guidestones. <clears throat> or uh, how you can kill yourself and contribute to a green and friendly world. And again, you know, this guy just makes me want to puke with the, with the uh, pages of justification telling us the way things really are, or actually were back in 1985 or so. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we it, it's kind of redundant. We've gone through this, so let's get, you know, get to the good stuff. But he starts off this chapter uh, eight with um, a beginning for the age of reason. When they start talking about age of reason, uh, head for the hills. Okay, here we go. Uh, this set the situation up. Although we have identified the problem, uh, the probable lines of our descent from ancestors who were less than human, the precise origins of humanity are lost in the remote past. Okay, you say so. We share with our forebears and with other creatures living today many anatomical and behavior features. We do not know when and how the spark of primitive reason grew sufficiently bright to transform us into what we audacious, aud audaciously claim to be homo sapiens, man, the wise. The arrival of our species was not, in, uh, not an instantaneous event, very likely it occurred gradually over many thousands of years. We have not yet completed the transition, our evolution continues even now as our emerging altruistic quality struggle to gain dominance over the animal fires which stubbornly smolder in our nature. <sighs> our species has always been divided into competing factions. Even today, race, national loyalties, and many cultural values conflict with the more positive impulses which might otherwise make us a single harmonious family. We feel menaced by neighbors who do not share our religious and political philosophies. Fears caused by these and other uh, differences trigger animal-like responses. Suspicion and competition, rather than friendly cooperation, continue to dominate uh, international relations. You know, I don't feel menaced by <laughs> beliefs in Mexico or Canada or any place else. You believe what you want to believe. You know, I don't even, you know, Islam's no big deal to me. But, you know, here you get the setup um, where, oh, yeah, we feel menaced, and then we go into animal-like responses. No, it's the handlers who make sure that friction stay very much afloat so that um, there will always be a problem, and they will provide us a solution, which obviously is world order. Uh, oh, well. So here's, here's where we're going to get into the solution part that, that you know, Mr. Christian is, um, is positing. War between America and the uh, Soviet Union is both unthinkable and unwinnable. The minds and hearts of humanity can be won only by rational means and not by violence. Leaders in uh, both countries should uh, jointly develop an international philosophy whereby a variety of political and economic systems can coexist in friendly competition. The human condition permits an infinite variety of social adaptations. Political patterns will undergo endless change in the future. We should not attempt to fit all nations to one pattern. No system is suited to all future time. If America and the Soviet Union will agree on this basic premise, together they can lead the world in a new nonviolent revolution that will make reason and compassion the guiding forces of humanity. Good luck with that. Americans seek a peaceful world. We resent having to maintain large military forces, but we are determined to preserve our political freedoms. We observe the Soviet Union, our recent ally and now our self-proclaimed uh, self antagonist, building awesome forces for war. Both we and they know that such forces are far greater than necessary for self-defense. Uh, we will not unilaterally disarm when confronted by a nation pledged to our conquest. We are not fools. We cannot accept claims of disarmament from self-declared en enemies without absolute verification of those claims. We are prepared to reduce our military forces and to grant our adversaries the same rights of verification that we are asked for ourselves. They reject any such proposal. We must, therefore, continue our efforts to block Soviet expansionism for a century if need be, even as we appeal to communist thinkers to seek political solutions for international frictions. Teachers advance, soldiers impede the progress of third world nations. Answers to our problems will be found in knowledge and cooperation, not in warfare and subversion. We cannot compel our potential friends in communist nations to abandon the rigid, te rigid teachings of Marx, <clears throat> nor can they compel us to modify the less pleasing features of capitalism. Thinking people in both nations must soon realize the utility of continuing the Cold War and its attendant arms race. Surely we are capable of stabilizing national boundaries by cooperative, cooperative actions of the families of nations. 
The difficulties are no more complex and no less uh, amendable to analysis and solution than they were problems of placing men on the moon or of deciphering the genetic codes of life. What we must now provide are the desire and the will to achieve that goal. Minds capable of discovering solutions can be found in all the major nations, if only we will seek them out. Let us join with the Soviet Union in establishing a World Congress of Human Reason to be located in Russia so as to balance the United Nations location in New York. Let us finance it with funds taken from the military budgets of all nations. Then let us gather in its halls the brightest and best minds from every corner of the earth to concentrate on the major problems of the human family with absolute freedom and objectivity. Its members will have access to all human knowledge. What does that mean? They will review the present state of humanity and its future prospects. The Congress will define... Uh, and rank our major problems and attempt to provide solutions for them. Its discussions will be open and vigorous. Its studies are hampered by excessive political loyalties. Its conclusions and proposals will be published for the considerations of citizens everywhere. Nations will be free to accept or to reject its recommendations and to advance new proposals. Eventually, a consensus can be reached on specific subjects. The first and most pressing assignment will be to expand and perfect international law so as to assure the territorial integrity and political interdependence of all nations. Boundary disputes must be resolved in a world court. Information must be freely exchanged and commerce encouraged worldwide. Freedom of the seas must be assured. Assistance and advice can be offered in addressing thorny domestic problems, such as those which plague nations in the Middle East. Collective intervention in the international affairs of a nation can be permitted only when it is clearly demonstrated that its government is tyrannical or excessively oppressive. Censure in the form of public condemnation or the application of economic penalties may be evoked when a nation is abusive to a minority of its citizens or to its neighbors. Does this make any sense to you? Periodic open elections coupled with reasonable voter qualifications are the most reliable means for uh, confirming citizen approval of a government. All nations should be encouraged to accept the discipline of periodic free elections. On the world scene, humanity must accept that level of international control as will achieve these limited goals. Basic uh, international law must be interpreted and applied through an impartial court system, which can act without fear of veto and with the support of the major nations and their moral, economic, and military sources, uh, forces. rather. In extreme cases, decisions of the world court must be enforced by collective military action. Only in this way can world peace be assured. It's the old, you know, constant war for constant peace. Atomic arsenals should be dismantled and their warheads converted to peaceful uses. Flower plots, maybe. It may be prudent for the collective international military command to maintain a minimum array of atomic weapons during the transition period to discourage the secret deployment of similar arms by any individual nation. And when that starts, you just start the race all over again. I'm not saying, I mean, these, these sound like platitudinous, well, they are platitudinous uh, precepts. But, um, you know, as we'll find out later, somebody else said from another arena, you know, this stuff's run by human beings, and they're not, not always the nicest people. In fact, quite often, those who seek this kind of power are uh, scumbags. In the political field, the peaceful interchange of ideas should be encouraged, even though this cannot be mandated. But terrorists, political activists, and assassins or subversives who seek the violent, violent overthrow of established governments must be prosecuted. Minimum standards for freedom of speech should be encouraged universally to enlighten governments on the informed views of their citizens. Neither we nor the Soviets have perfected our political and economic machinery to provide the greatest good for the greatest number. Our enterprise and economy can be modified in many ways so as to maintain economic incentives while avoiding an unhealthy concentration of wealth through inner, uh, inheritance or mon uh, monopolistic practices. The Soviet Union may find, it's advantageous, may find it advantageous to bring into the political process a larger, a more diversified segment of her population. She may find it helpful to adopt certain capitalistic incentives for stimulating economic efficiency. Increased personal freedom for her citizens may be beneficial, beneficial for all. And it, yeah, of course, that's what's happened. Communism has been more capitalized. Capitalized has been more communism. Socialism has been more capitalized and communist. I mean, all three laboratories that have been in the United States, uh, Europe, and Russia are being now brought into one system. And when you always have an, when you have an oligarchy on top of it, it doesn't make a difference what they call it. You're screwed. Debates in the United Nations Assembly and discussions in Geneva seeking the regulation of military weapons, although of some value in temporary, uh, temporarily reducing tensions, are premised on continuations of the faulty attitudes of history. They do not recognize or address the sources of our conflicts. 
The abolition of war will require a fundamental change in national philosophy of all nations. The atomic arsenals of the major powers provide sufficient and obvious cause to accept that change universally. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, collective human reason, common sense, can be the ultimate weapon with which this goal can be achieved. Extreme nationalism and fanatic political and religious faith can be tamed through persistent appeals to inform reason. Excessive reliance upon our net rational powers can be tempered with a respect for tradition and by our acknowledgement of the fallibility of all that is human. And I mean, this bit about going to nationalism, again, as Orwell has written an excellent uh, essay on with regard to national versus patriotism. I mean, we're watching nationalism getting pumped up today. It's, you know, it's, I mean, when I do listen to those, um, you know, jocks, talk show hosts, like Schnitt, you know, like um, Beck and Limbaugh to a certain extent, though he's a bit more urbane than the other two. I mean, they just beat the drum for they hate us for our freedoms. We got to do something about this. We got to build up. Our... So anyway, all those, all those millions of people, hundreds of millions of people probably are, are listening to this stuff and swallowing it down. They present it with a certain boogeyman, and they will go for anything that will obviously act like a deterrent or a cop or a 700-pound gorilla with a big freaking stick, and because uh, that will keep us safe. And all that's going to do is lead, lead us into another war. So when it states here about um, extreme nationalism and, and fanatic political and religious faith can be tamed, it, it, it doesn't usually rise up unless it's conjured or instigated or provoked. And that's what's happening now. So people will get jingoistic. They'll back a war that will be ultimately the most destructive the world's ever seen. And then, hence, the United Nations, the Vatican, um, will be more than happy to lead a one-world uh, government, a world order. Um, that will be anything but um, benevolent to uh, the little people. Like, for instance, you and me. Traditional patriotism consists of an unswerving loyalty to the principles and interests of one's nation. No, I think that would be nationalism. It is a strong social force in wielding dissimilar individuals and parties into effective unified forces in the area of international relationships. But excessive parochial patriotism has caused great human suffering and conflict, which applied reason might have avoided. I don't even know why he distinguishes that from nationalism. Uh, today, the entire world is confronted by common problems of overpopulation, here we go again, resource deple depletion, here we go again, and threatened atomic conflict. Right. You're right. These overshadow the continuing but less cataclysmic traditional frictions which pl uh, still play their historic role in unsettling the tranquility of the family of nations. We must develop a new patriotism on a larger base that will reflect the shared interests of all humanity and, on, uh, and all life on Earth. A World Congress of Human Reason can provide leadership in reshaping basic human attitudes. Its recommendations must reflect the collective common sense of humanity, tempered with appropriate respect for our religious faiths, our ethical awareness, and all our emotional and spiritual needs. Old initiatives by Americans and Russians can establish this new agency and help it resolve the physical conflicts uh, which plague our species. And finally, a vigorous and ongoing World Congress can hasten the dawning of, a new, uh, of the era foretold by the biblical prophet Isaiah. Oh, here we go. Yeah, throw in a little biblical stuff just to get everybody on board. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will, shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. All right, that has been uh, chapter 8 of the book Common Sense Renewed. Uh, the Georgia Guidestone, subtitle, um, by whoever, or, or uh, that means a plural too, uh, Robert Christian is. Uh, all right, and we'll be moving on to Chapter 9 on Revolution. Oh, you're going to love this one. Anyway, thanks for being with us for this uh, reading of Common Sense Renewed. We'll catch you next time.